Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about a completely new discovery of something a little bit unnerving. An idea known as gigantic super flares. Solar flares so extreme that they would actually dwarf anything we've ever witnessed and anything we've ever recorded for the past few hundreds of years. And this is something that was recently identified in one of the studies. Studies that as always you can find in the description below and something that a lot of scientists believe would be extremely important for us to understand and potentially prepare for as well. A super flare of these proportions would be catastrophic to our society. But let's talk a little bit more about this, mostly because this is something that's basically completely new and something that nobody ever expected. And so what exactly do we know? Well, when it comes to our sun, we know that our sun generally seems to be a somewhat mild star. It doesn't really produce a lot of flares, it doesn't really create a lot of powerful emissions compared to some of the other nearby stars, and to some extent it seems to be a somewhat sleeping giant. It's calm and it's usually not awake. In contrast, our neighbor Proxima Centauri, the nearest star to us, is what you would call a flare star. It produces an extremely large amount of very powerful flares, many of which would hypothetically strip the atmosphere of the planet in just a few million years, especially since many of the planets around a typical flare star or a red dwarf would be way closer to the star compared to a typical G-type star such as our sun. And many different studies came out in the last few years suggesting that many of these flares around red dwarfs would not really be hospitable to most of the life on those planets. With only one single study suggesting that in some cases these flares would only be affecting the polar regions of stars, not necessarily the planes of orbits where the planets are. But for the most part today we believe that a typical red dwarf is not really that hospitable because of these flares. And when it comes to flares from our own sun, the typical event we normally mention is the so-called Carrington event. The extremely powerful magnetic event caused by an extremely massive coronal mass ejection that occurred back in 1859 and ended up producing aurora in some really remote regions even close to the equator, while also causing a massive disruption to the early telegraph, even causing fire in several regions where the telegraphs were available. Even back then, the scientists were able to observe and document this magnetic storm, with the actual intensity being visible in this measurement right here that sort of goes way, way above the graph. And there's at least one paper you can find in the description that goes into more detail in regards to various aurora observed from Columbia back in 1859. But there were obviously some other geomagnetic storms as well, not as powerful, but powerful enough. There was one in 1921, there was one during the Second World War, and more recently there was one in 1989 that caused a severe blackout for several hours in the province of Quebec, essentially knocking out the entire electric grid of the province. But we've discussed a lot of this in one of the previous videos. The thing is, this is not at all what we're discussing today. Very recently the scientists identified something else, something even more extreme, something that's, to some extent, comparable to what you would have around a flare star. They've identified something they refer to as a geomagnetic superstorm. But before we talk about this, I also wanted to mention this particular study that recently came out as well, that actually identified at least one major problem with the current grid that could be easily affected by even a relatively minor geomagnetic storm. And this particular study focuses on the way we set up our cables that are used in the global communication network. Even though most cables are generally not going to be affected, Today, most of the communication is also done using what's known as a repeater, even when it comes to cables that run underneath the oceans. Today, the cables are more or less protected, but every 50 kilometers or so, there's normally a repeater that makes sure that the signal stays strong. These repeaters are extremely vulnerable to various geomagnetic disturbances. And in this particular study, the investigation determined that a geomagnetic storm would actually knock most of them completely out of service, which in effect would surprisingly create not a worldwide web, but a kind of an isolated web. Basically, you would have regions completely isolated from one another, mostly because of the way that the network is set up. For example, certain regions like Asia, where the hub itself is in Singapore, and most of the locations are connected using shorter cables, would not really be affected as much, and in this case the network will survive and will create a kind of an Asia-Pacific wide web. 
And one of the main reasons why Singapore would not be affected as much is really because it's very very close to the equator, where normally geomagnetic storms are at the weakest. But based on the C4 composition and a lot of other grounding effects, certain regions on the planet, like for example Northeast US, would be way more affected than other regions. And so in this particular case, if such an event were to occur, it would very likely isolate Europe from North America and North America from Asia. But this is of course a little bit off topic and just something I wanted to mention based on one of the very recent studies. But in this case we're talking about something similar to the Carrington event. However, both the Carrington event and a lot of other storms of the last 200 years are not even remotely comparable to what most likely happened in the year 775. Something that was at least 10 to possibly 100 times stronger in terms of geomagnetism. This particular solar superstorm was originally described in the paper you can find right here back in 2018, with the findings coming from various tree samples that contained a much more elevated levels of carbon-14 compared to carbon-12. In this case, by the way, this is exactly how carbon dating works. Normally, by comparing carbon-14 to carbon-12, we can determine the age of a certain sample. But in trees, sometimes certain rings have a much more enriched levels of carbon-14. And usually this implies that something extremely energetic happened somewhere out there. And though it could be potentially a supernova, a much more likely explanation is usually an extremely powerful solar flare. Or to be more exact, a coronal mass ejection that increases the amount of radiation and amount of magnetic particles reaching the planet, which then creates the geomagnetic storm. By the way, the reason why there's an elevated levels of carbon-14 is because carbon-14 is generally produced through the interaction of upper atmosphere with a lot of very powerful particles, such as galactic cosmic rays or very powerful solar rays that first produce nitrogen-14, which then turns into carbon-14, which then is captured by the plant and becomes part of the carbon cycle. But once in a while, scientists discover these unusual carbon-14 spikes. And this one in 775 is one of the biggest ever found. This particular spike, or this particular event, was so powerful as a matter of fact that it sort of acquired its own name. Today it's known as the Miyake event. Named after Fusa Miyake of Nagoya University, who originally identified these unusual observations. But when the scientists found this, they thought this would be some sort of an extremely rare, ultra rare event. Possibly once in maybe 10,000 years, maybe once in 100,000 years. Something that our sun doesn't really go through a lot. And that's of course until this recent paper. It identified two more of these Miyake events in the last 10,000 years. Specifically about 7,000 and 9,000 years ago with both of these events just as powerful as the original Miyake event from 775. And what this of course implies is that, well, at least three of these extremely powerful solar emissions, or these very powerful geomagnetic storms, hit planet Earth in the last 10,000 years. Once again suggesting that these events are way more frequent than any of the scientists believed when they first identified this a few years ago. And since this implies something that's 10 to 100 times more powerful than the Carrington event, these types of geomagnetic superstorms would be completely devastating to our society. Moreover, we actually don't even know what kind of damage they would cause. At the moment, we don't even have basic understanding of smaller geomagnetic storms. We don't know how much damage even a smaller event would cause to our extremely interconnected society and civilization. And so trying to understand what exactly happened and how to prevent this would be extremely important for us. But I'm sure some of the future studies will most likely discuss this in more detail and possibly identify some dangers and some solutions. To me personally though, what was more interesting is to discover, well, how exactly do we know that this was from the sun and not from some sort of a supernova or some other energetic event, such as a, I don't know, a gamma ray burst or some other unusual event. Well, technically it could be a nearby supernova, but because we generally know the frequency of these events in the nearby space, and we know most of this from studying other galaxies, scientists today do not think that this is possible. They don't think supernova happened frequently enough to be able to produce three of these events with the effects observable on planet Earth. In this case, the effects from the Sun are just way, way more likely. And there's at least one study you can find in the description that establishes without a doubt that the 775 event was most likely a coronal mass ejection that created an extremely powerful geomagnetic storm. 
At the same time, to make this point even stronger, scientists generally compare different samples from different regions, and here they don't just look at trees. They also collect a lot of ice core samples and study the composition of various gases inside of them. So just like the trees accumulate in carbon-14, a typical ice core will also accumulate isotopes known as beryllium-10 and chlorine-36. And so by measuring the amounts of isotopes compared to the more stable elements, and by then comparing this to ancient samples from various tree rings, we can start establishing various patterns in regards to the amount of radiation the planet was receiving, and specifically types of cosmic radiation that changes compounds into other compounds, and so in this case enriching the atmosphere in carbon-14 and beryllium-10. And also when it comes to tree ring samples, generally the scientists have already collected enough to sort of establish a timeline from the past 12,000 years or so. And so both the tree rings and the ice core samples in this case contain enough data to establish these three very powerful events. Interestingly enough, neither the tree rings nor the ice cores contain the Carrington event, and this actually suggests only one thing. Carrington event was probably extremely mild in comparison to these gigantic super flares or super coronal mass ejections that caused extremely powerful geomagnetic storms. And there's also at least one paper that even suggests that ancient Chinese astronomers witnessed a lot of these aurora during the event in 776, which once again confirms that this was some sort of a geomagnetic storm. And so in the end, what does all of this mean? Well, for one, it suggests that our planet seems to be once in a while affected by extremely powerful geomagnetic storms. At least three of them happened in the last 10,000 years. Moreover, at least 80% of data is still not really fully analyzed, suggesting that even more of these events could be hiding in some of the tree rings, which also suggests that these events could be much more frequent than we originally thought. And also means that our sun is not a sleeping giant after all, it does once in a while wake up, and wakes up with an extremely powerful geomagnetic storm. But how likely are we to experience this in, I don't know, in the next 100 years or so? Well, when it comes to Carrington events, the scientists today believe that there's about 12% chance that we're going to experience a Carrington event in the next 10 years. With the chance obviously increasing, the more we wait. But when it comes to these extremely powerful magnetic storms, we just don't really have enough data yet. They could happen in the next 100 years, they could happen in the next 500 years, or they could happen maybe in the next few thousand years. Because we currently identified only three of them, there is just not enough data. But based on the data we have right now, we should be okay for at least a thousand years from now. Nevertheless, considering how powerful this would be, and what effects it might actually have on our society, studying this and trying to analyze this in more detail is probably one of the most important things we can do right now in order to preserve our current civilization and to try to prepare for a potential geomagnetic storm that could completely disrupt our way of life. And so these geomagnetic storms, even though we sort of got lucky with them in the last few decades, might happen any time now. Anyway, on that note, we'll definitely come back and talk more about this once the scientists discover more, but until then, Thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, check out the relevant links in the description below, and share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences. Maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else, maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description, and either way, stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.